Good evening, and thanks for being here. And welcome to the Society for Extraordinary Experiences, I guess. From my uh, talking with a few of you before, it seems like I'm in the presence of many people with extraordinary histories, extraordinary lives, extraordinary activities. <clears throat> I hope a few of the things that I say tonight may be of some interest to you. I've actually never been asked to make a lecture like this or a presentation like this. And I've been making presentations since 1968. So this is a lot of fun and also a little unusual and maybe even scary for me. <clears throat> As I want to thank Gil Ferry I think it is, for inviting me here this evening. I'm sorry he can't be here. I'm shocked to hear of his recent experiences and travels. I didn't realize that. <clears throat> and I wish him a speedy recovery and back in your fold. So what I'm going to do, I know I have a little less than an hour maybe to talk. I have about 10 or 15 slides to show you, and I'll say some things and try to remember some stories. <clears throat> They're more or less in chronological or order. Some people asked where I was born. I was born and raised in Omaha, Nebraska, in the Midwest, the Cornhusker state. As my wife says, she's from New York. We have a mixed marriage. She's from the East Coast, and I'm from the Midwest. Uh, she says it's one of those rectangular states somewhere west of New Jersey. My father, <clears throat> Nate Marcus, may he rest in peace, as you see here, was in the Army at one point, <clears throat> right before I was born. And um, <clears throat> my mother, Libby Marcus, Libby Burstein Marcus, um, helped out with my father after he took over my grandfather's cleaning plant. I don't think you can see all the grandparents here at the top right, <clears throat> but these are my mother's parents, these are my father's parents, and these photos sit in my house over the fireplace now. Here is a view of the downtown of Omaha, Nebraska, as I knew it when I grew up as a small child. My father was born in Russia, in a small village, Lvova, east of Odessa, on the Black Sea. He, like many Jews in the end of the 19th and early 20th century, escaped Europe and came to live in the U.S., he was a handsome guy, a uh, knock-around fellow, never finished high school, a street fighter. But he settled down with my mother and raised a family of two sons. My brother Stephen, who unfortunately two years younger, died some years ago from the same heart problems that I almost died from. But we raised, they raised a nuclear family there in the 1940s and 50s in the Midwest. <clears throat> My father had served in the Army. I remember growing up, he had lots of uh, 105 millimeter shell casings around, 75 caliber shell cases and maybe some bullets also, 50 caliber bullets, he would make um, ashtrays and lamps out of all of these things. And it, we thought they were kind of cool. He would tell us a few stories. <clears throat> he was the oldest member of his uh, teammates who were uh, actually stationed in Doton, Alabama. And uh, he was responsible for re repairing aircraft I thought they were called AT-47s, but I must have the nomenclature wrong. Sorry about that. <clears throat> he, uh, 
He ran away a number of times, ran away to the West Coast, to California. He was a welder. He was a sportsman, baseball player, wrestler. I was a great disappointment. I wasn't a sports guy. <clears throat> in fact, I could barely see until I got glasses at the age of eight. No wonder I couldn't hit any of the balls that he threw. But uh, they knew that education was important. And so they put my brother and me through school, through college, and even through graduate school. My parents never had that opportunity. And certainly I'm grateful for it. And at the end of his life, he served in a Jewish war veterans group that would give scholarships to underperforming kids like my father to make sure that they could go on to college. So he knew how valuable education was. <clears throat> my mother was more shy, quiet. Her mother had been born in Kiev, in Russia, or now the Ukraine. I actually had a chance to visit my father's small village in 2008, a hundred years after he was born. It was interesting to see this place in a windswept terrain, devoid of almost anything, <clears throat> looking a little bit like some parts of western Nebraska. When my brother and I were children, we used to tell stories at night. Did you do that with your siblings, if you had them? We each had a teddy bear. And we would make up stories about these teddy bears who would go off on great adventures, flying to other worlds. We were inventing our own childhood science fiction stories, although I don't think we knew what science fiction was at the age of, I don't know, three, four, five, six years old. <coughs> I do remember that on one of these planets, we saw how, how babies came into being. There were trees, and the little babies would grow like fruit on the trees. First you'd see their little heads, and then when they got ripe and their full little bodies were ready, they'd fall off and start running around. That was our birth myth that we created. We even invented something called the Big Book of Knowledge, in which you could find the answer to any question. This was 50, 60 years before Google and the internet. That was our idea of how knowledge could be found. <coughs> I was in the Cub Scouts and the Boy Scouts, although I didn't last long in the Boy Scouts. I was myself an avid reader of comic books and science fiction. I loved it. I learned how to draw Walt Disney cartoons and comics. Little Abner, Dick Tracy, I'm sure you know some of these people. And we loved to listen to the radio programs, The Creaking Door, uh, Fever McGee and Molly, and the wonderful crazy closet with everything that would fall out every time they opened the door. I collected all kinds of comics and mad magazines and comic books, some of which I still have. I just learned that my number one issue of mad comic book is worth $500. I bought it for 10 cents. Not too bad for an investment. I started reading Scientific American when I was probably eight years old. <clears throat> I still read it. Still a subscriber after 62 years. My uncle bought my brother and me a three-inch reflecting telescope. It was just a large cardboard tube with a polished concave mirror and a little sighting scope at the top. We thought that was incredible. We could see the moon and Mars and the rings of Saturn and Jupiter and Jupiter's moons. I still have that 
in my living room here in Berkeley, California. And just the, <laughs> just, just the other night, I took it out to look at the moon, the full moon. I thank my Uncle Max, who brought us, bought us that in 1952. In high school, I actually did wear a uniform of ROTC, R-O-T-C. I suppose some or maybe all of you took ROTC at high school or sometimes college. I thought it was pretty exotic to be able to wear a uniform and learn how to take apart an M1 and put it back together again. And I even had a sharpshooter's medal. But <clears throat> I've got to admit, I didn't serve in the armed forces because although I was about to be drafted in 1968, I was 1Y because I'd had a collapsed lung. And I guess the military thought I would be an unfortunate expense if they took me in. All through my childhood, I loved science and art, drawing, making things. When I was 10 years old, I invented my first rocket ship control panel made out of stuff I found in the alley in trash cans, plus uh, the electrical equipment that my father had. We put things together put them into orange crate boxes or cardboard boxes, put them all together in a corner of the basement house of our house, put a big white sheet around that and called that our rocket ship control room and we could fly to the moon, fly to other planets, etc. Surely we were influenced by all the rocketry and post-World War II aeronautic devel developments. <clears throat> This is the only surviving picture of my, one of my devices, which I called uh, something like a radical hydroscopic lunar dimensional hyperspectrum sinusoidal tabulating operating system communicating radio neutron something or other, which for short I called the Goo Goo machine. And <clears throat> this is the space helmet I designed from uh, my brother and myself, uh, modeled by my late brother. The, the ray gun was something, of course, that was purchased in a local toy store. In those days, even at 10 years old, I was a certified nerd, a geek, a weirdo. For me, my excitement was memorizing the mathematical uh, 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 constant pi, pi, to 50 decimal places, which I could recite on command, 3.14159265, etc. I've forgotten most of the decimal places because no one ever asks me to recite it. <laughs> I was always interested in art and science. I was also interested in publishing. I became the editor of the high school newspaper. <coughs> I did a lot of cartoons. I did uh, drawings on high school notebooks. I pinstriped cars and did other things, sometimes to earn money or just to become more popular with my classmates. Here are some of my drawings from that time, just about 1953, 54, 55, <clears throat> just before Yuri Gagarin, was it, went up, the Russians sent him up. And all these kind of rocket ships were being published in, do you remember, Collier's Magazine, Saturday Evening Post. I loved all those stories. I still have some of those sheets that I would tear out from the magazines and I have them in my collection of things because I'm a collector. My kids hate it, my wife hates it, but 
I got a lot of stuff. <coughs> but some of that drawing and some of that interest in technology continued and powered some of the professional activities that I did in the decades that followed. <coughs> Certainly, in high school, art class was my favorite class. My art teacher was my favorite teacher. But I did well in, in science and mathematics also. And that let me move on to attend a prestigious college, Princeton University, as an undergraduate, where I could become part of the physics department, one of the best physics departments in the world. But by the age of, by the uh, year 1965, when I graduated, I had achieved escape velocity from physics, and I landed in art school. I decided I wasn't going to go on and become a laboratory scientist at IBM, which was a straight path. And instead, I was going to wander around in some other paths through life. <clears throat> so uh, due to a kind of mentor as an undergraduate, I applied to several art and design schools. I got in actually to all of them, but I took the one that would let me become a graduate student instead of starting all over again as an undergraduate. And that was Yale University's graphic design department. So I went there and studied graphic design. In the meantime, before that, I had learned German uh, for physics. If you wanted to be a a scientist in the 1960s, you had to either learn Russian or German. So my father knew Russian, he spoke a little bit, my mother, my grandmother spoke some Russian. <clears throat> I decided to study German uh, because it would help me to understand Yiddish, which is a mixture of Hebrew and, and uh, German. So I studied, I should point out, I studied Latin for four years in high school. My friend and I used to speak Latin just for fun. It would drive his father crazy when he would drive us to high, to high school because he thought we were speaking in some strange foreign language. <clears throat> um, but we had fun learning Latin, and I had fun learning German. I worked in Germany in 63 and in 65 as a summer uh, uh, exchange intern. In uh, one company, the first company was... Uh, uh, Buderus, Buderus, ironworks in, in Wetzlar, Germany, near Frankfurt. And it was pretty strange for me to be in Germany. Twenty years before, we had been fighting a war with those people, and they had murdered many Jews. I wanted to go and see what this was, to experience this. I heard strange and unpleasant comments from time to time from people, but I must admit the people that I had contact with were pretty nice to me. And their being nice to me as an intern meant that for the rest of my life, I've had many interns and I've always gone out of my way to be hospitable, friendly, warming, uh, warm and inviting to them. In 65, I worked for MAN, Maschinenfabrik Augsburg-Nürnberg. In uh, Augsburg, they created many heavy industrial equipment and trucks and so on. <clears throat> you may know the name. And the death camp of Dachau was not too far away. I felt I should visit that as a Jew. So one afternoon on a weekend, I went to the camp by bus, I guess. I arrived somewhat late in the afternoon, <coughs> planning to see it. We didn't have the internet then. You know, you could check the hours and find out all kinds of information. 
when I arrived at the ticket office of this camp, as now a tourist site, the fellow at the ticket office said, I'm sorry, but the last uh, tour group has already gone in. You, I can't sell you a ticket. You can't get in. I'm sorry. You'll have to come another time. I said, there is no other time. I've come from all, all the way from America. I was speaking German to him. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I'm an American Jew. I'd like to see this place. Uh, it really is important. It's tut mir leid. I'm sorry. I can't help you. And there are the rules. And all the rules for what you could and could not do were, of course, all listed there in a big sign. So I didn't know what to do. I, I walked around to the side and peeked in a window to see what I could see. And I noticed there were some tourists going through the rooms. And they saw me peeking in the window. And one of them came over and said, uh, can I help you? Uh, is there something wrong? I said, well, you know, I was, I was trying to get into the last tour group, your group, and the ticket taker wouldn't let me, and I've come all the way from America. <clears throat> it's, I was just trying to see what I could see. And that guy said, look to the left and look to the right, and said, well, why don't you sneak in here through the window? So literally... I sneaked into Dachau. Most of the Jews who were there and gypsies and other people were all trying to sneak out, those who survived. But I managed to get in. And I sort of tumbled in through the window, <clears throat> straightened myself out, tried to make myself look presentable, and joined the tour group moving through the, the rooms. And I, <clears throat> I wandered around and looked. And actually, I waited for a word from God. What was I going to experience here? And finally, it came to me. The word was, don't hate all Germans. If you do, you will be just like the Nazis who hated all Jews. That's what I thought I got as a message looking around this death camp from 20 years earlier. <clears throat> Had I been born 20 years earlier and in Germany, I might have died there, but I didn't. Luckily, I was born <clears throat> in the US. I remember something that um, one of my colleagues at Bell Labs in Murray Hill, New Jer Jersey said to me <clears throat> in about 1968, during the anti-war movements and hippies and everything, I was sort of a half hippie. Um, he said, don't forget, you can play around here and be a hippie if you want, do whatever you want. Because the armed forces of the United States keep some people out. If they weren't here, there are a hundred million people who would run over your house, move in, kill you, or do whatever they wanted to because they want what you have. I've never forgotten that. I was at Murray Hill and Bell Labs to learn programming for computers. It was quite funny how I got the job. I was an art and design student at Yale. Uh, one day, one of my colleagues said, you know, there are people coming from these high-tech laboratories. You know programming. You learned it uh, <clears throat> somewhere. Oh, I know, at Yale. You should go for one of the interviews and see if they have a summer job for you. <clears throat> so I followed his advice, and I went in. And I sat down in front of two engineers dressed in dark suits. They only needed black sunglasses to be like the men in black, you know? <laughs> they were looking at me, and I didn't know what to say or do. And I said the one thing you should never say at a job interview. I said to them, I have no idea why you would hire me. Uh, uh, but I, I do have this background in science and physics, and I 
learn programming by myself and I'm in a design school learning visual communication. Can you do anything with that? And the two of them turned to each other, smiled a little bit, turned back to me, and one of them said, Actually, we're looking for someone exactly like you. <laughs> I was surprised. And after that, my career in computer graphics and visual design, my whole professional career all came from that meeting. I became a summer intern. <clears throat> I played with computer graphics systems that had just been invented Three years before, it was the first time television screens were ever connected to computers. I had around me the most advanced computer graphics equipment that existed in the world. AT&T Bell Labs was one of the premier laboratories. I hardly knew what it was. I didn't know any of this as I tumbled into this situation. <clears throat> I remember having another somewhat religious experience the first time I was ever completely surrounded by a computer. I went into one of the main control rooms, air conditioned, fans whirring, central processing units and other peripherals all sitting around <clears throat> me and I realized I, I don't see anyone else here. There's just me and this beast, this thing that's taking over the world the creation of our minds, but now something beyond almost anyone's comprehension. And that was 1967. It was a religious experience. And I realized that the high priests of the culture were the engineers, software engineers, who were leafing through printouts that were just page after page of gibberish hexadecimal code, and they would say, oh, here's your problem right here. I'd say, really? You, you, you can interpret that? It was like they were looking at goat entrails 5,000 years ago. The high priests were looking at this strange stuff and telling me the future. Okay, if you say so, I'll change something. That was how I did programming. <clears throat> so. I created computer artworks. I, on the right, I programmed a desktop publishing system for the picture phone about 10 years ahead of any commercial product development when I was at Bell Labs. And I began teaching it. I went back to Princeton in the School of Architecture and Urban Planning in 68 and began teaching there. I also became married and within a few years, my ex-wife and I had our first children, our, our two children. <clears throat> so during that time, not only was I teaching graphic design and visual communication, teaching uh, printing in a, in a 19th century printing press, and also being a researcher in computer graphics, depending on the day of the week, I would work in the 19th century, the 20th century, or the 21st century. Every week I would cycle through centuries in the kind of teaching and, and graphic design work I was doing. <coughs> I also <coughs> did work as an artist. You see here, there I am, a lot, a lot more hair than I have now. Ah, the old days. <coughs> Would you buy a used car from this guy? <laughs> Looks like he might be an anarchist about to throw a bomb, but I wasn't doing that. I created some playful conceptual works that had to do with uh, writing and drawing, but at a very large scale. For example, in this one conceptual artwork, after many, many weeks, maybe months of talking with AT&T. I went into a telephone booth at 42nd Street and 5th Avenue in New York City and initiated a conference call. At that moment, 
five, uh, uh, four other telephone booths in the United States in the downtown streets of Omaha, Nebraska, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Washington, D.C. began ringing. People walking by heard a public telephone ring, and out of force of habit, they answered the phone. Hello? Hello? Is someone there? Yes, I want to speak with you. Because it was just about connecting, uh, the work was about connecting people electronically through telecommunications and crossing out time and space 3,000 miles across the United States. <clears throat> so this piece was called An X on America because the five cities involved make kind of an X. So we talked about the weather, politics, Nixon was the president, I think, and about what this could mean as a work of art. And while we talked, we had a large X, 3,000 miles, drawn electronically across America. <clears throat> in the bottom center, in another project, I went again with the help of AT&T <coughs> to the United Nations building, the basement of the UN. There was a long bank at that time of public telephones. I picked up one phone and made a call to the phone next to me. However, the call went to AT&T's Long Lines office by satellite and cable to Tokyo, to Germany, across the Atlantic, back to New York City, and I could pick up both phones and give a short lecture to myself on the meaning of this work. Actually, when I spoke into that phone on my left, maybe, I could hear my voice circling the earth and coming back to me half a second later because that's how long light takes to travel around the earth, or at least with all the telecommunication equipment in between. In fact, it's quite difficult, with, as you may know, with feedback delay to actually keep talking when you hear everything a half a second late. So I stumbled through this giving a short uh, message to myself on the meaning of this while I drew a circle around the earth, or a zero. And that's the title of that work, A Zero Circle Around the Earth. In the top center, I was trying to sort of, through telecommunications, draw an asterisk, you know, a bunch of lines all going to a circle. <coughs> In this case, I was trying to get to Queen Nur of Egypt, uh, not of Egypt, of Jordan. It turns out that Lisa Halabi, who became Queen Nur, the wife of King Hussein of Jordan, was my student at Princeton. So I knew her. And I tried to communicate with her. I was trying to get her to invite me to her wedding. But I failed. Later, months later, I got back a message finally from her secretary saying, I'm sorry the queen was busy. Too bad it didn't work out. I couldn't work out a permanent teaching position at Princeton. I didn't quite fit in because I was teaching in a school of architecture and urban planning. And I was a graphic designer. So I left and I moved to Israel. I thought at the time that I would emigrate and live in Israel. It didn't work out. <clears throat> I came back and became a research fellow at the East West Center in Honolulu. Do any of you happen to know it, ever hear of it? It's a center for research for the whole set of countries around the Pacific Basin. They knew in 1978, when I went there as a research fellow, that the future of the 21st century was not around the Atlantic Ocean, it was around the Pacific. China, US, and whatever happened in between.
At that time, I was only staying there for about six months, and I uh, left with my wife and moved to Berkeley, which I had visited first in 1971. I felt intuitively that I could really enjoy living in only three cities on Earth. It's rather narrow-minded, but those were Berkeley, Jerusalem, and Boston. Those are all university towns. That's what I need around me. Berkeley's got nice weather. So my uh, ex-wife and I moved here. Unfortunately, we got divorced. Three years later, about four years later, I married my wife, <clears throat> whom we had invited over for dinner because my ex-wife and I felt sorry for her because she was a single mom trying to raise two kids and we were happily married. Little did I know a few years later, the circumstances would change so dramatically. I taught at Berkeley uh, 79 to 80, and in about 81, I became a staff scientist at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. They couldn't figure out what else to call me because I was sort of a designer, but I, I'm not an engineer. I wasn't a programmer. They just didn't have a category for me, so they called me a staff scientist. Actually, <clears throat> I did the same thing with Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory that I did with AT&T Bell Labs. I walked in, I decided after moving internationally many times in the past few years with my family, I couldn't do that again. I didn't have the energy or the patience. So I said, I'm going to get a job anywhere I can within a, 15 to 20 minute bicycle ride or walk from my house. I don't care what I do. And then I thought, wait a minute, there's Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory right up the hill. They have a lot of computer equipment like I worked with at AT&T Bell Labs. Maybe I can get a job there. <clears throat> I called up the head of the computer science and mathematics department, convinced them to meet with me for five or 10 minutes, walked in the door, and said, I don't know why you'd want me here, but I, I have this background in computer, computers and graphics and visual communication. I, I think I should be doing something with you guys. <clears throat> and I at least convinced him that I wasn't a complete kook. And he said, OK, we'll give, you, we'll give you a try. So boom, I had a place to work. I was very happy, <clears throat> but sitting in a little office doing the research work that I wanted to do, but I realized I could do more. And I started to write papers, and out of nowhere, people invited me to give a keynote lecture for a conference in computer graphics, the, the largest computer graphics conference in the world at the time. And after that, people started calling me about consulting, and I thought, I think I should be doing something else. So I took a deep breath. I quit the lab. I started work on a research project with a friend of mine in Toronto funded by DARPA, which is the US Defense Department's Advanced Research Projects Agency that helped to create the internet, helped create much of uh, modern computer technology systems. And they funded me for two years to research how to show computer code better, so it was more legible, so the software engineers could understand what they were writing. And that helped me to get started in my company, Aaron Marcus & Associates, which has been going now for 31 years. But at the start, I had no idea how to be a business person. I was a teacher, a university professor, academic, researcher, conceptual artist. Well, gradually I figured out how to do that. But by the way, my wife and I went to the Soviet Union in 1990, in May. As you may know, the Soviet Union was just collapsing. I had arranged to give a workshop, I think, in Helsinki. So we went 
to, um, <coughs> to um, Moscow. I remember my wife buying some bread, some food, in the fin fin Finland grocery stores, and I thought, what are you doing that for? That's crazy. Little did we know, we would need that in the Soviet Union. <laughs> there was almost nothing in the stores, no vegetables. People were not allowed to move from the countryside into Moscow because there wasn't enough food to go around. And it was pretty strange because <clears throat> I had made contact with a center for computer technology that had money straight from the Minister of Science and Technology who worked right under, who was the head of the Soviet Union then, I can't quite remember. But we went on the subway out to some place far in the suburbs of Moscow, walked into a computer lab, and there were PCs and Macintoshes and other stuff while everyone was starving in, in the rest of the country. They had money for some technology, and this particular lab, uh, Pet Project to Introduce Technology into Russia, <coughs> was well-funded. It was quite bizarre. Anyway, we arranged to go by train from Moscow to Budapest, and from there to Vienna to get back home. <coughs> it was a wonderful trip going by train feeling like we were back in the 19th century with drinking Russian tea from samovars and glass jars and delicious tea. And we came to the border with Hungary. It was four in the morning. A guard came through the train and wanted to inspect our papers. And I knew that I had a few rubles which were not allowed out of the Soviet Union. You couldn't take them out. And I thought, shall I tell him I've got them? Or, you know, it's not, I don't know, eight bucks worth of US currency, maybe. <clears throat> I decided to tell him I have them. I thought maybe we might get into trouble if they caught us with them. And he didn't speak any English, but he motioned to me, go back in there into the train station and, and change them. You, ha you can't take them out of the Soviet Union. I said, it, it's, it's four in the morning. No one will be open. Go back, go back. OK. I went into, back into the train station. It was completely dark. In those days, <clears throat> as you may know, there might be one light bulb in the entire giant railroad station that would still be burning. Everything else had been removed or burnt out. I'm wandering around in half darkness with other people who are wandering around in half darkness, trying to figure out where, where would one change money, because I can't read any of the signs, nothing's in English. <clears throat> I finally saw some pictograms and arrows and saw that I must go up the stairs to this office, and there was the uh, money exchange office, only it was pitch dark, four in the morning. I, didn't know what to do, but out of sheer random hope, I knocked on the window. And lo and behold, after a few minutes, a light went on. Some official came out in his pajamas and, and, and indicated, what do you want? It change money, change money. <clears throat> OK. He brings me in. His wife or girlfriend or whatever also in her pajamas, comes out behind the desk. They turn on the light. <clears throat> they start to change my money. And then he asks me, where is that form that you have to have from your passport? When you come into the Soviet Union, you have to give it up on the way out. Boy, I think I left it in the train. OK, wait a minute. I'll, I gesture I'll be back in a moment. I run down the stairs in the darkness <clears throat> through the big hallway out to the train, run back to my wife in the bags and say, you won't believe it. I have to have this one little piece of paper. Then I can get the money. Then we can go. I grab that piece of paper. I run back into the train station, up the stairs to the office, complete my transaction and get 
eight one dollar bills. Okay, I, I did it. I'm, I'm looking at the walls and the posters thinking this is the last time I'll ever see all of this. Go down to the train station uh, room, go out to the tracks and I'm thinking, uh, let's see, uh, why do the trains look a little different? Uh, actually, where is my train? I, I thought it was this train. I knock on some windows and people start screaming at me because I'm waking them up. And I realize my train is gone. <laughs> Along with my wife, my passport, any money, my bags, everything, gone. I thought, what in the devil is going on? Am I dreaming this? <clears throat> I turned around, getting a little panicky, ran back into the train station. It's all people like in a dream of darkness and one light bulb moving around aimlessly. <clears throat> I start yelling, does anyone speak English? My wife has disappeared, no money, no passport. No one can speak English. No one knows what to do with me. I'm getting more and more frantic, screaming and yelling. I don't usually do that, but I didn't know what to do. Uh, I mean, did I? <laughs> anyway, finally, some woman comes up and with a little bit of English says, don't worry, don't worry, go through that door, everything okay. So what could I do? I went through the door and I enter a brightly lit room full of many, many bureaucrats, clerks, all stamping pieces of paper and doing paperwork. And she gestures, go on, go on through that door over there. <clears throat> so I wind my way through this surreal collection of people at four or five in the morning stamping pieces of paper with lights and everyone else is in darkness. <clears throat> I go through this door, the door shuts, and where am I? I'm in a queue, in a waiting line, to get back into the Soviet Union. Uh, but you need passports to do that, uh, to get into the platform to get to the trains, to, to go back or, or out of the Soviet Union. And I, I didn't know what to do, so I just kind of ignored protocol, pushed past many people waiting in line to the guard sitting at the gate and say, no passport, no money, wife gone. Does he speak English? I don't know. But he said, eh, go on through. <laughs> <laughs> so I went through this gate and now where am I? I'm in the place where everyone is waiting for the trains, but I have no tickets, I have no passport. I start yelling again, does anyone know English? And finally someone comes up to me <clears throat> and says, können Sie Deutsch? He asks if I can speak German. Yes, I can. Uh, I don't know what's happening, I explain. He says, don't worry, everything will be okay. How do you know, how do you know? Don't worry, everything will be okay. What can I do? I wait. I wait another 40 minutes. Everyone <clears throat> is milling around in the half darkness. And suddenly, I see a, a train coming in. It, it's my train. And there's my wife waving frantically at the window. And it stopped. And we could all rush out and get back to trains and do whatever we needed to. What happened? Some of you may know. After Napoleon invaded Russia, Russia said, never again will we be invaded by land from Western Europe. And they changed the gauge of the railroad tracks. So any train wanting to come out of the Soviet Union has to be by car lifted up, new wheels put on and set down onto the narrower gauge track. That's what happened to my wife and passport, bags, and money. We were tearfully reunited and we continued our merry way to Budapest. Anyway, one of many.
things. Along the way, I've <coughs> written or co-written or edited or co-edited 14 books. I've published a lot of articles. We've worked for lots of corporate clients, Microsoft, Apple, 3M. I'm sure you know all these different names. Um, <coughs> In uh, 1997, working for Nokia, they told me, here, try this phone. It was their latest and greatest. They said, you can call anywhere you want in the world. Oh, really? Okay. So I called my wife every 20 minutes. You know, I wasn't used to this ability to do this before Skype and other things. 1996, actually. And I thought, I'm going to Israel shortly for another conference to lecture. Maybe I can give a guest presentation in the Kingdom of Jordan <clears throat> to celebrate at that time better peaceful relations between Egypt, Jordan, and Israel. And the, U and the US uh, working together. So I thought, well, I'll I'll call the royal palace in Amman, Jordan, and see if the queen will invite me. So there's this number in Finland where you can say, I'd like the telephone number, a number of some place in the world. Could you please go find it? And they did. They found the number of the royal palace. I called the royal palace from my Nokia phone <clears throat> and said, uh, you know, I, I once taught your queen, and I was wondering if I could give a a free workshop in Amman, Jordan for technology people. They were a little suspicious, but they said, well, fax something to the queen and at this number and we'll see what happens. So out of my little computer, I faxed a one page proposal saying, I want to give, you remember me maybe, and I want to give a workshop. The next few days I flew back to California. Within a day, I got a fax back to my office. The Queen's secretary said, OK, you're on. So <clears throat> when I went to Israel that time, I also crossed the, uh, the Allenby Bridge into Jordan and had an audience with Her Highness, Queen Noor of Jordan. She's a very pretty woman, looks like Grace Kelly. We talked about our kids, what we've been doing for the past 20 years, and uh, I asked her if she had any message to Israeli technology people. Jordan and Israel were cooperating somewhat, but they had lots of reasons to not cooperate. And she said, well, <clears throat> I tell you, I think the business relationships that are going on between Israel and Jordan are good. They won't make peace, but they'll help to keep peace. Because if business people are interacting, uh, there's more of a momentum for keeping relations and trying to solve problems without going to war, which I thought was a pretty wise thing for her to say. <clears throat> Around that time, in 1997, 96, uh, no, 90, while I was there, actually, in Petra, do you know where Petra is? It's in the south of Jordan. Uh, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom or Lost Treasure was filmed partly in Petra. It's a beautiful rock-cut city where the Nabataeans lived 2,000 years ago. And I was walking around there and happened to have a slight heart attack. I didn't realize that at the time, but I sure didn't feel well. And I didn't feel well even when I was seeing the Queen. Um, <clears throat> I didn't realize what had happened. I only found this out when I got back to the US, had triple bypass heart surgery, and luckily survived. My brother, two years later, also had heart problems, and unfortunately, he died. Uh, my father had died in 94. My mother became ill and died in uh, 2000. That was the end of the nuclear family. So I'm a sole surviving uh, member of the foursome. Uh, meanwhile, <clears throat> my company grew to about 25 people in Emeryville, California, and also in Manhattan until the recession of 2003. I have a little pet project, by the way, to solve the recession and the money problems that are facing us now. 
you may not be in favor of this guy on the, our currency, but the idea is anyone can be pictured on our currency provided that person's sponsor pays $100 million to the US Treasury for advertising or PR purposes. If you don't want to have your picture there, you can have your grandkids' picture there. There are 400 billionaires in the United States. They can afford $100 million. It's hard to get that money out of them through taxes because they always have clever assistants to figure out how not to pay. So this gives them something substantial. <clears throat> Imagine Tom Cruise, Warren Buffett, Bill Gates. There are all kinds of people who have enough money and maybe enough ego to want to see themselves on our own currency, including people from outside the United States. We may not like it, but uh, we're, we got a money problem here that we have to solve pretty quickly. This is one way within five years to uh, erase half of our deficit if enough people sign up. And on the back, corporate logos. Apple, Google, Microsoft, do you think they have 100 million to throw away on this? Of course they do. I've published this in the Financial Times and in a few other places. I've tried to get Warren Buffett uh, to pay attention to this, but haven't succeeded so far. But in case any of you know some $100 million millionaire mm -hmm. or billionaire, <clears throat> um, let them know that this might be possible. We just need to call the Treasury Department to make sure it can be done. Another thing we've been doing for about four years is uh, creating little apps, uh, concept designs for mobile applications, in this case called the health machine to improve uh, health of people, nutrition and exercise by convincing them to take better care of their bodies. <coughs> we've published these projects. We've actually done eight of them and we're just at work on the last one right now called the happiness machine. How can a little mobile phone make you happier. Not, not like sugar or caffeine, short term and then you crash, but help you to live a happier life by staying connected to people, by being more grateful, by being more positive. These mobile phones and other devices can actually help do this. Another thing I've been busy with for a couple of years now is trying to start a center for innovation in my work in Shanghai, China. It's a slow go. It's difficult and challenging to try to convince people that they should do this and fund my center, but I'm still working on it and will be leaving in about uh, two weeks for Hong Kong and Shanghai to talk to the people again and go back in December to uh, give a little workshop at this Datao Academy where I'm a master. I also chair a conference that takes place around the world to bring professionals who are interested in improving visual communications and technology through the screens of devices, computers, refrigerators, car dashboards, whatever. That's what I do uh, for a living still. <clears throat> Although I'm 70 and I am slowing down. <coughs> so I do love to read detective novels. I didn't know I was addicted to this until a few years ago. But mysteries and detective novels, especially the ones from the 1930s and 40s, when my parents were growing up, because I can read the story of the murder mystery and the detective solving the clues, but in the background is the world of my parents that they grew up in, they lived through just before and at the time of my birth. And it's like being with them again, which I enjoy. I also bought a car, uh, not a car, a guitar, and am hoping to have time to learn how to play enough so that I can go to senior centers and sing my favorite rock and roll songs from the 1950s, which maybe they will enjoy, I don't know, or folk songs or something like that. So <clears throat> that's uh, at the moment what I'm doing besides enjoying playing with grandchildren traveling with my wife, and continuing to enjoy the puzzles and the problems that are presented to me in the professional work that I do. Uh, we've covered, well, 70 years, 
in about 70 minutes. I appreciate your time and interest. I think it's time for me to stop. Thank you. Not as exciting as some of the lives you've led, but what can I say? That's mine. Your life was intriguing. <laughs> well, it's different. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when I talk with people now, I love to listen to their stories. I learn so much. Everyone's life is interesting. When I was young, I thought I was unique. I thought I had been deposited on the earth from another planet, like Superman, uh, with my parents. And I thought, oh my gosh, how did I get these parents? <clears throat> but later in life, I learned I'm just like everybody else. Stupid, smart, sometimes do the right thing, sometimes do the wrong thing. And I enjoy hearing about where people grew up what kind of lives they've led, as I enjoyed hearing uh, Tom and Jeanette talk about their, <coughs> am I right, 70 years of marriage? Unbelievable. Were so, you when you were born, huh? uh, yeah, uh, I'm 1943, they got married in 42. I got married in 43. 43, sorry. That's right. Amazing to me. So uh, I'm, I'm really honored and excited and, and enjoying very much the chance to meet some of you and talk with you because uh, I don't often have that opportunity. And it's great to learn from you. Thank you very much. Time to go home. Good night.